We also have uh, online maturity on here. But she is certainly often is an advisor. Ms. Susan Smith, I saw her in the back. She's an advisor. Tony Taylor, he's not able to make it. Patrick Preston, up here in the front. And Mason Good, I saw him right here in the middle. Also, Ms. Marsha Bloodworth is our district coordinator. She is one responsible for this entire event this evening. So we could while she's standing in her around the park. Yeah. <laughs> 
are a sanctuary dedicated to the rescue and rehabilitation of wildlife throughout Kentucky. We are on the Mead and, Irv Mead and Brett County line. We're a 4,600 acre uh, sanctuary dedicated, like I said, we get, we got an animal hospital just like you would for human beings, like an uh, emergency. They come in, we got two vets that work on staff, and our main goal is to rehabilitate wildlife and let it go back. We have spots that we release deer at, we have spots that we release coons at, we have uh, these, these girls here are licensed rehabilitators, I'm a licensed rehabilitator. And first thing I have to say before I show y'all any birds is that possession and exhibition of migratory birds is by permission of U.S. Fish and Wildlife. What that means is that we have permits to show these birds, to take them off the sanctuary property and to show people like y'all and to educate the public. Today we brought some birds of prey. Does anybody know what a raptor is? Usually I have a kid that sticks his hand up and says, dinosaur. <laughs> But no, a raptor is a bird of prey. And what I mean by a bird of prey is your owls, hawks, and uh, mainly birds that plunge and eat other birds, basically. I got the big boys of the, of the food chain tonight. So the first bird that Scott's going to pull out is a peregrine falcon. Her name is Loki. Now, peregrine falcons are very common in the United States, as well as in Kentucky, obviously. Uh, they are the fastest bird species on the planet. They can hit speeds of up to 240 miles an hour in a straight dive. They're not going to be cruising through the sky with your 747s or anything. But if she was perched on a high skyscraper or a tall tree and she saw a rabbit run across the field or a sparrow fly across the sky, she'd be able to dive down to that prey item at 240 miles an hour and pluck it right out of the sky. And this is one of the most common birds used in the art of falconry. Does anybody know what falconry is? It's the hunting of prey by using birds. Now this bird was almost extinct. Yeah, this bird was almost extinct until I think it was the early the early 70s. There used to be a y'all being conservationists and all. Y'all know what DDT was? DDT got into the streams here, and it made these birds, along with the eagles, get on the endangered species list because they couldn't hatch. They could have eggs, but they was too thin to actually hold up and hatch. So what happened was some falconers got together and they, they paired these birds up and she is now completely off the endangered list, along with your bald eagle. And of course we quit using DDT. All right. Any questions on Loki? No? We'll pull out MJ next. There. The next bird that we're gonna pull out for you is another falcon, an American kestrel. This is Mama. Now, fal or American kestrels are one of the smallest falcon species on the planet. And you'll see what I mean when she pulls her out. She, this is a full-grown falcon. And she has a very unique job with us at Broadbent. If we get in a clutch or a group of baby American kestrels, we can put them in the same uh, enclosure as Mama here, and she'll actually help teach those babies how to pick up food, tear food up on their own without having to have human interaction. Because if we get in a bird or of an owl, hawk, eagle, songbird, what have you, if we get in a bird and we have to constantly go in there and hand feed them every 15 to 20 minutes or every three to four hours, that's a lot of human interaction that otherwise wouldn't happen in the wild. So with Mama here, we're able to completely eliminate most of, most of the time the human interaction with the baby kestrels, which great, greatens their chances of being released into the wild successfully. You gonna talk for them? Nothing? Again, this is your full-grown American kestrel. Off, more commonly known around farmers is sparrowhawk. Big bird? Okay. All right. The next bird that Scott's going to pull out for you guys is the second largest owl species on the planet. <laughs> this bird is called a Eurasian eagle owl. And given its name, it's not native to Kentucky, let alone the United States. She was actually brought over from her native land, Europe, Asia, your Asian eagle owl. She was brought over and sold to a family in Lexington who had her illegally in horrible conditions. So being... So being that... <laughs> Being that she's not a native bird in the United States or Kentucky, it would be highly unethical to re or release her into the wilds of Kentucky. So with that being said, that's how we were able to get our permits to house Athena. 
Now, she also brings up a very good point. All these birds are wild animals. It doesn't matter how often we work with them or how much we think we can control them, they are wild. They're gonna do what they wanna do at the end of the day, no matter what. Athena has a five and a half foot wingspan. She has talons that are about two and a half inches long. Talons are at the end of the foot. It helps. When a bird of prey goes to catch its prey, it actually sinks the talons in to kill and carry it away, back to eat. Be good, be good, no. Don't worry guys, front tables, she can't get away, I promise. <laughs> but you will get a nice fanning from her, from her wings. You built those five and a half foot wings, didn't you? Now, just in retrospect, five and a half feet, that's how tall I am. From foot to the top of my head, that's five and a half feet, and that's how wide her wings are. Now, she can eat anything, pretty much. Obviously, given her size, you would expect that, but she'll even go after small insects, grasshoppers, crickets, things like that. Um, she, if she was in her native homeland, she'd probably go after smaller mammals, dogs, cats, things like that. Um, she could also take down small baby fawn if she was given the chance. Also, go fishing. So, very opportunistic eater, this one. Now on your owls, all owls, their ears are located right behind the eyes. I'm not going to touch hers because she'll rip my hand off. But right here behind her eyes. These things up here are actually called ear tufts. They absolutely have nothing to do with the hearing. It's to show alertness or uh, show blend in with the trees around them and things like that. But the ears are located right here behind the eyes. Good girl. You have any questions on the Eurasian eagle owl? Her eyes are actually orange, or just yellow. Kind of like a pumpkin. Y'all want to see her wings one more time before I put her up there? There you go. Good girl. Why, why is she hissing? She's hissing because she's very unhappy. She's very unhappy. Go ahead. All right. How old is she? She's about 11 years old. And this is the, this is the thing. It, in the wild, she'd live up to 25 years. Oh, In fine. captivity, she can live up to 60 You're okay. years. You're okay. So I said she's 11, she'll probably outlive me. <laughs> she'll be here for a while. I wish she was in her homeland free, but yes, yes ma'am? She weighs close to nine pounds. It's all feathers and talons. Did you go bird. Who's next? It was 8.4 last time I weighed her, so close to nine. All right, Gizmo. Gizmo, yes. You get Gizmo? I do want to get Gizmo. The next bird we're going to show you is one of the largest owl species in Kentucky and the largest tufted owl in North America. Hi, honey. And when I say tough, I'm talking about those ear tufts. They absolutely have nothing to do with hearing. The technical name for them is plumber. I know, it's loud out here. You're okay. Shh, shh, shh. The name is Gizmo. Shh, shh. It's a great horned owl. Shh. There you go, you're fine. We got her. Right. There she is. All right, so as Scott said, this is Gizmo, great horned owl, largest owl species native to Kentucky. She's the one that you'll probably hear in your backyards or if you're hiking through Freeman Lake or places like that. Gizmo has a very unique backstory. So I was talking to you guys earlier about Mama and how she helps eliminate the human interaction when they come in as babies. Well, Gizmo actually came in on with a group of owlets or in her clutch. The rest of her family was released successfully. Gizmo was also released. When we release our birds of prey, we will put a microchip in their chest right here. And that's just to help identify them if fish and wildlife catch them or another rehabilitator catches them. They're able to locate that chip and identify this bird, find out where she was, who worked with her and so on and so forth. So when Gizmo was released, she would go to people's houses. She would go to people's porches, farms, barns, places like that, looking for somebody to feed her. Again, the human interaction kind of dwindled her ability to survive because if she was to land on the wrong porch or the wrong farm, somebody would take it upon themselves to get rid of the owl. So when we released her, we released her three times. She came back all three times. At that point, we realized she's too attached to people. She can't, she's refusing the hunt on her own, so that's why she's here with us now. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. 
Those talons feel good. Now again, even though she's very used to people, she's still a wild bird. I'm gonna see if I can get her to talk a little bit for you. It always happens. There you go. Wanna talk? Wanna say something to him? Talk to him. Tell him about it. Stage fright? He's got stage fright, sorry. Usually she'll hoot for you, but that's a lot of people out there, so come on, say something. Talk. <laughs> no. <laughs> come on. Good girl. Good girl. If it wasn't for her lack of ability to hunt for herself, she would otherwise be a relatively successful owl out in the wild. She can fly, she can grab food, she almost tore my hand off there, but the fact that she will always go to people for food is why she can't successfully be released, which is what we try to avoid as much as possible, hence when we can find a surrogate to help us with that, we use it to its fullest potential. Now, the next owl she's going to show you is, is not a baby, it's a full grown owl. A lot of people say, oh, it's so cute, it's a baby, but it's a full grown owl. Okay. It's your eastern screech owl, one of the smallest breeds in Kentucky. His name is Ear. He gets his name from the same plumicorn as these guys have. And you need a hurry. Get up there, Mr. Ear. There he is, there you are. <laughs> so again, this is Ears, Eastern Screech Owl. Eastern Screech Owls are the fourth smallest owl species on the planet. So believe it or not, there are actually three owl species that are still smaller than Ears, full grown. That would be your Sawwit Owl, your uh, Pygmy Owl, and your Elf Owl. Do you have any questions on the Eastern Screech Owl? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. A lot of, uh, most of your owl species are night hunters. Um, the reason being is their, their adaptations made it a lot easier for them to hunt. So they have the bigger eyes that help them to draw in more light at night when there's very little. Um, also, they have excellent hearing. So Scott mentioned earlier that their ears are located behind their eyes. A lot of owls will have a facial disc. So Gizmo has what looks like sunglasses just right there. Well, later when we get to our barn owl and our barred owls, they have a full facial disc. And what that disc does is help to amp, when the sound hits their face, it helps radiate it and amplify it out to their ears to help them hear a little bit better as well. Now, the peregrine falcon is, is what they call diurnal. The like peregrine falcon, your hawk, your eagle, and that means they hunt during the day. All your owl species, like she said, are nocturnal. And the owl can turn its head 270 degrees each way. And the only reason why it can do this is because it cannot move its eyes from side to side. And Al's eyes are fixated straight all times. That's why it can move its head so far around. <laughs> She's even any looking. Questions on the little Al? You ready? You know she is. Ears has been here a lot longer than I have. I've worked here for five years. I think Ears has actually been with us. As you can see, his right here, his, his left wing droops further than his right. That's why he's with us. And the, Hence, educational bird. Uh, I'd say he's probably around 12 or 13 years old. Any other questions on ears, the eastern screech owl? All right. All right. All right, let's show him a hawk. Show him a hawk. The next is one of the most common hawks you see in Kentucky. You'll see him on your power lines. You'll see him uh, basically in your backyard. Some people call him a chicken hawk. I call him a red tail hawk. Her name is Baloo. Like the jungle book. Be good now. Come on. Come on. No, no, no. Come here. Get your wings. There we go. Hey, hey, hey. All right. So again, this is Baloo. She's a red tail hawk, more commonly known as a chicken hawk in some areas. She's the one that you, again, will see perched on power lines. If you're driving, say, from Elizabethtown up to Louisville and you're taking 31W, there's a good chance you'll see at least three or four of these birds perched on power lines or in the trees or on fence posts and places like that. 
red tail hawk can see, if she's sitting on a power line, she can see a mouse about a half mile away in the field. That's from the old, that's the old saying, I'm watching you like a hawk. That's where it comes from, right there. You can always tell a red tail hawk too by their brick red tail. Now, a lot of times in captivity, a bird in captivity, no. A bird in captivity would come down with something like bumblefoot. Uh, birds of prey are not meant to stay on the ground for an extended period of time, but when we have birds with old wing injuries, it's almost impossible for them to get off the ground for a good duration. So they're grounded, and when that happens, all the extra weight and all the bacteria and things getting under there, that's why it's important for us as rehabilitators to make sure that their environment is clean as possible. We will have to check their feet for bumblefoot, which is kind of an infection. You get it in your chickens as well, and the only way to really successfully get it out is to pluck it all out and hope that doesn't come back. Now what she's let me do, well, actually, well, she taught me how to do it, is I can check her feet by letting her show me. I'm not going to shake hands with a hawk, so if you ever see a, a hawk in the wild, kids, don't touch it, don't try to shake its hand, because this bird will hurt you. Let me see this one. Let me see this one. This little bird, come on. No, just no. See it. What I'm doing is I'm looking for sores on the bottom of her feet. Now, if she wanted to, she could get me real good. Good girl. Let me see this one. Let me see this one. Now, this is this is actually for her protection. So when I go to check her, I don't have to stress her out. I don't have to grab her and hold her and have somebody else hold her and open her feet and check for sores. If she'll show me her feet, that just gets rid of all the stress. No. Get back up everything, girl. Do you have any questions on the red tail hawk? Oh, wait. Oh. Good girl. No, good girl. The next owl I'm going to show you is what a lot of people confuse as a barred owl. We're going to pull out Twitter, our barn owl. And I was mentioning earlier about this certain adaptations that owls have acquired over the millennia, or several years, several hundred years. Anyway. The facial disc that barn owls have is a heart shape. It's very, uh, very unique to that species. Um, again, the facial disc helps to amplify sound, so it acts like a satellite dish on the owls. Now, Twitter has an also unique story. She came to us as a baby in a clutch as well. Um, a lot of people who are tearing down old barns, old silos, or just cutting down trees in their backyards, always want to check, you always want to make sure that you check those, those buildings or structures for nests or wildlife because if you tear it down not only are you taking away their home but you're potentially um, hurting them as well with all the debris falling down and so on and so forth. So this family that found her clutch did check the silo and they found the clutch of baby owlets. So they called us immediately, we brought them in and when a clutch of birds is in a nest, the parents have to make sure that each owlet or each baby bird all get fed, correct? It's the only way to ensure their survival. Unfortunately, with some individuals within the clutch, they're not able to get to the food as quickly as their bigger, stronger siblings, which happened to Twitter. And due to the lack of nourishment that she got while in the nest, she has a foot deformity, which doesn't allow her feet to open fully or grasp uh, uh, accurately or strongly enough to carry prey away. That's why Scott's able to do that. She can't grasp tight enough to hurt anything. So that's why she's ended up being here, but well, the rest of her siblings were released back out into the wild. Now, a barn owl has a couple of unique qualities that most other owls don't have. One, she has what is called a pectinate claw. And what that is, is on each one of her talons here, on the third finger here, it's built in like a built-in comb, like you comb your hair with. So when she's trying to make herself look pretty, she's got built-in combs. Another thing that she has is she has the ability, uh, Lydia said that you know, uh, they're most common in silos and in barns and things like that. Well, if you're out cutting your hay and this bird wants to sleep, she has actually flaps over her ears that she can shut. She can shut all of us off right now and just go to sleep if she wanted to. They come in handy if you got little bitty ones. Y'all have any questions on the barn out? Okay. Yes. What color are her eyes? They're black. 
Again, that's to help with her seeing at night. A lot of um, the darker the shade of eyes uh, lets in the certain amount of light that's allowed to be let in. She keeps looking up because all raptors, they try to find the highest point where they feel safe. So she keeps looking up, so she's going to try to find a high point in here where she can get away from all of us and feel safe. <laughs> You're not going nowhere. Right. Who's next? It's a... Uh... Barda. All right, so the next owl that we're going to pull out for you is a barred owl. Again, a lot of people will get it confused, barn versus bard. A barred owl is B-A-R-R-E-D, where barn is B-A-R-N. So if we get a call and you say it's a barn owl, we drive out there and it's actually a barred owl. It doesn't really change anything, but that's what we can use that as an educational point as well. They look nothing alike. You saw Twitter just now, the barn owl. She has that very unique heart-shaped face, white face. Your barred owl is much more camouflaging looking. And this is Ryder. A barred owl, as you can see again, has that very prominent facial disc. And as the barn owl as well, they don't have the ear tufts that perk up. They can be identified if you look at her chest. She has bars going across her neck and up and down. They look like big black bars. And as you can see, she has a wing amputation. Now, as rehabilitators, we are not allowed to amputate anything past the elbow. Now, when she came to us, she came uh, with a, she tangoed with a barbed wire fence, which with most birds, they're not very friendly. When a bird gets caught in a barbed wire fence, they twist, they thrash around, and unfortunately, that tears ligaments, tendons, crushes bones. Um, so due to the severity of her injuries, we did, in fact, have to amputate the wing, and now she's one of... Uh, She's one of our oldest educational ambassadors. If you guys have come out to Broadbent during Christmas tours in the past, we've had her sitting up on a perch with Santa getting a picture taken with the, all the kids. She's one of the most docile barred, barred owls I've ever met. A lot of the times they're trying to climb away from me. They're really good with their feet. They're, they climb trees, they climb fences. Really good. Y'all have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, sir. All the birds that we've shown you today are natives to Kentucky, with the exception of Athena, the Eurasian eagle owl, native to Europe and Asia. If you see her in your backyard, you need to call somebody because she's not supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> somebody done let a pet loose is what they've done. Do you have any more questions? You had a question? All owls, All owls yes, mm -hmm. ma'am, do spit pellets. They spit pellets because their bodies cannot, they cannot digest everything like the bones and some of the fur. So what happens is their body sucks all the nutrients out of whatever they eat whole. Like this bird here, we eat anything from other birds to mice to a rat. Uh, she eats a snake, uh, some insects. But what, what she can't process, what she does is twice a day, she, she, she kind of regurgitates a pellet to come out, different size of whatever she ate. If it's a small mouse, it'd be a little pellet. If it's a bigger mouse or a rat, it'd be a bigger pellet. But yes, all owl species, they have pellets. Any other questions? They don't have to be specifically about Ryder. They can be about any of the birds that you've seen today or Broadbent as a sanctuary, anything like that. I have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Being that we are a conservation organization, how many rodents do the uh, birds that you brought here typically take annually? How many what? Rodents. <coughs> we buy all of our rodents. Uh, no, I mean in the wild. The, the purpose of these birds in the wild, the wild need to. Oh, okay. Uh, so a typical bird of prey, it depends. Um, in the wintertime, it's going to be a lot harder to find food. A lot of mammals are gone, burrowed under the ground, you know, so on and so forth. So they could go a few days without food. And now in the summer or springtime, they would probably, it depends on the bird again and the availability of prey. A uh, barred owl, for example, could probably catch a few birds, a few rodents, moles, gerbils, um, minks, things like that, probably a couple times a week, depending also on the size of the prey. So if she's looking for mice, she'll probably catch a few mice every week. If she's looking for a larger prey item, like a larger rat or a mink or a beaver or something like that, she could probably live off that beaver for a day or a week or so. To answer, to answer your question, these guys are important in the ecosystem because without owls, hawks, we would be overran with mice here in nature. Rat catchers, they're nature's mice trap. They eat insects, they eat snakes. 
anything that we'd be overran with, it would be that they keep the ecosystem even. Right. So and the more mice they eat, the more snakes they eat, the more mosquitoes they eat, the more bugs they eat, the less we deal with them. So these guys are great for that. Now some people don't like them because they're getting their chickens and things like that. Just remember, if they're eating your chickens, just throw, throw a mouse or something out there and they'll go away from your chickens. Don't shoot them. It's against the law to shoot them. These guys are a help for us, not a hurt for us. That's what he was getting at there. They are very important to the ecosystem. Without these guys, we'd be overran. Especially with all the silos of corn and all, all the crops and things like that, we'd be overran with mice, rats, uh, snakes, and things like that that these guys eat on a daily basis, which helps even out the ecosystem. And if we're overran, if we're overran by your vegetation eaters, not only would we have a surplus of herbivores, but we'll have a decrease, significant decrease in the flora population as well. So just, they keep everything in balance being a predator. Predators are good. Any other questions about Broadvent or what we do specifically on a day-to-day -day basis at the sanctuary? Y'all want to see the big owl in the glove again? <coughs> Why do you wear it too? Well, I wear it too because, like, if you remember me saying, she has two and a half inch tap. You hear you barred out? There you go. She's talking to us now. She has two and a half inch talons. And this is my training glove. I don't know if you can see it very well. But those are all from talon marks. I train these birds an hour every day. That's my job. Mm -hmm. Training that bird an hour. To try to get it to sit up here, be able to show you all like that, and you get on the glove where you can get a closer view. When I, when I do an eagle or a Eurasian eagle owl, I have to double the glove up because she would tear my arm completely in pieces without even trying. So that, that's why I have two gloves. You gonna be good? Be good. Do it right. You're right. Be good, girl. Come on. Come on. Come on. Good girl. Good girl. Yeah, honey. Come your wings. Come on. Good girl. Yeah, any questions on her before I put her up? She has better attitude. No. No. No, this is this bird and I have a, we have a mutual agreement. She wants to bite me and I know it, but she lets me handle her. Go ahead. Come here. Good girl. She's very aggressive. None of these birds are pets. They will still bite, they will still hurt, they're still wild. You know, our, our goal is not to make them pets, but to just get them where we can take them and show them to people like y'all up close. God, you said someone, mm -hmm. someone actually purchased her on the black market as a pet. It's not illegal to purchase them on the black market. It's legal to have them. I might have said that backwards. It's not illegal to have them, but it's illegal to purchase them. But once you have them, see, that's where the black market laws need to be better looked at. Is they can buy a thing, they can buy creatures like Athena and have them in a little bitty bitty cage where she can't even open her wings in her living room thinking it looks cool. You know, this bird needs a moo. Her moo is about 22 foot by 30 foot. It's about 18 foot high. That means she can fly and go back and forth and fly around as much as she wants. She can spread her wings. Now, our, her true happiness would be in the wild over in Europe and Asia. But we try to do the best we can to provide a good home for all of our uh, animal ambassadors. Any more questions on her? That brings up a good point. We do what we can for all the animals, not just the educational birds, but everything at Broadbent, from food to medicine to the enclosures, keeping up with the enclosures, building new enclosures, is all funded through public donation. We are a certified 501c3 facility, so any amount of donation, you can go online. Uh, broadbentwildlife.org, or you can go to our Facebook page, or call the 4200 number on these brochures that you guys are more than welcome to take, and call, make a donation, go online, make a donation, things like that. It all benefits the stability of Broadbent as a sanctuary, so that we can continue to, <laughs> so we can continue to care for and maintain the sanctuary and care for the animals and release back as many as we can. Now we don't just do birds, we do mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds. Birds, songbirds, raptors, 
rabbits, raccoons, possums, deer, um, basically any type of wildlife that's native to Kentucky we can work with. So if you guys ever find anything, it's always important. First, identify what's going on. If it's a baby deer just laying in a tight circle in, in some bushes or in a tree line, give it a little bit. See if mom comes back. Mama deer only feed their babies two to three times a day. And the, while she's not there, she's off foraging for herself, looking for a new spot to take her baby. So if the baby's just tightly wound up in a little ball, leave it alone for a little bit. See if mom comes back. Once, once it starts to stand up and cry, not only is it giving away its position via sound and sight, so predators can find it now. So once it starts making noises and walking around, that's when you can call us and we'll figure out a way to get to it or have it brought to us. But any wildlife you come across, especially if we, we stress this for the young ones, is do not touch them. Yeah. Even maybe the cute little raccoons, the cutest little raccoon you ever saw in your life can have rabies. Mm -hmm. You see, so don't touch it. Tell mom and dad, have them contact Fish and Wildlife or call us. We brought brochures up here, like Lydia was telling you, to show you a little bit about my, what we do. There's some pictures of baby deers in there. And uh, we're basically, if, if you find a hawk that's injured, you call us, we'll come out and pick it up in one of our vehicles. If, if you're not on the other side of Kentucky, we try to have people help us out now, but we were going all over the state of Kentucky with ambulances to pick it up hurt wildlife. If a bird comes in, it's got a broken wing, we have a vet. We actually have two vets now, but we have a vet that's certified to go in and just like when you have that surgery on your arm, he'll go in, set pins in the wing, and, and, and you know, uh, cast it up and hopefully with a little bit of uh, rehabilitation, that bird can be released back into the wild. So mm -hmm. that's our main goal right there is to do that. Yep. But if we don't have to intervene, we don't want to intervene. So the baby deer lying in a tight little ball, it's always good to observe. Find out, see if you can find out what is wrong. Is it a broken leg? Is it just walking around in circles? Is it a broken wing? Is it weak looking or lethargic looking? If, some, if there's something wrong with it, obviously wrong with it, call us. But do a little bit of observation. See if it's just laying down sleeping, if it'll get up, walk away, or if you approach it, if it'll take off. Things like that. We don't want to intervene if we don't have to. You guys have any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. How many different types? Well, that ranges from season to season. So in the springtime, which is coming up, well, baby season is what we call it, we can get anything from baby raccoons, possums, all the way down to your baby sparrows and wrens. We can have a plethora of different species ranging from mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. But in the winter time, it's mostly, we get mostly birds and mammals, as far as I can tell from past. And we also have emus, ostriches. We've got one ostrich now. Oh yeah, we have farm we animals. We have the Equine Society of Kentucky, and we have 56 horses that are rescued. We have uh, anywhere from, a lot of people, you see online, a lot of people get these little miniature pigs. You see online, everybody wants a little cute miniature pig, but there's no such thing as a miniature pig. That miniature pig is eventually going to be 150 pounds in your living room. And a lot of people try to find a place. Well, we have about 13 miniature pigs that are 150 pounds. We got goats. We got, and those all stay with us at the sanctuary. So if you come out to see the sanctuary, you can see the horses. You can see these guys and their moves. That's what we call their habitat. And you can see a lot of, of, of different things. We got, we got some geese swans and things like that that can't be re they're released into the wild but they stay in our pond where it's safe you know they can't fly off because they got wing injuries but they're permanent additions to broadband we got peacocks just come check us out on the online or the mm -hmm. brochure and come out and give us a look yeah. i thought i saw another question yeah how often do we find them in the wild well, that's a funny question. I work with wildlife every day, and I can tell you, honestly, I've never seen an injured wildlife individual in the wild. But I've seen birds fly around. I've seen groundhogs run across the road and raccoons run across the road. But it's, very good. it's a good idea to be vigilant. Um, I'm a very big bird watcher. When I'm not at work, I still go home, and I sit outside, and I watch for birds. Um, but as far as injured wildlife, I've never seen one. She's wanting to talk to y'all. Talk. Tell them. Not gonna do it. 
No, no. <laughs> sorry. She's not going to do it tonight. Well, let's give uh, Jennifer, Lydia, and Scott a hand. I'm going to have Bruce Book come up. He's one of our supervisors, and he will be announcing some awards. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, it is my honor to present the uh, school winners, the individual school winners for the Jim Claypool Conservation Art Contest. First up, we have Rhineville Elementary. Uh, second runner up at Rhineville Elementary is Mr. Toby Varble. Toby is a fourth grade student at Rhineville Elementary and is the proud student of Miss Courtney Howard. Toby loves to build robots and play baseball. Is Toby here? All right. The first runner-up is Miss Taya Bruner. Taya is a fifth grade student at Runnyville Elementary and is a student in Miss Henderson's class. Taya loves reading and drawing and writing. I believe this is Taya on the way. The winner is Miss Jaden Dyer. Jaden. Jaden is a fifth grade student in Miss Mills' class at Rannieville Elementary. The award is presented by Jacoby Sales. Next up, we have St. James Catholic School. Second runner-up is Mr. Connor Sloan. Connor is a fifth grade student at St. James and is in Ms. Stucker's class. Connor loves to read, play basketball, play soccer, and study Greek mythology. First runner-up is Mr. Trey Stucker. Trey is a fifth grade, in, fifth grade student in Miss Ballard's class at St. James. Trey is on the SJS archery team, 4-H livestock, and shooting sports club. The winner is Mr. Trent Johnson. Trent is a second grade student at St. James in Miss Wimsett's class. Trent loves to read and play basketball. The award is presented by Jacoby Sales. We have Trent. Our next school is Lakewood Elementary. Second runner up is Miss Riley Pike. Riley is a fourth grade student at Lakewood. Elementary in Mrs. Icy's class. Riley is in 4-H, plays softball, loves art, and playing with goats. The first runner-up is Miss, and I'm going to mess this one up. Inyan Marshman, a fourth grade student at Lakewood in Mrs. Ice's class. She loves cooking and playing volleyball. The winner is Miss Olivia Irwin. Olivia is a fourth grade student at Lakewood in Mrs. Ice's class. Olivia loves crafting and gym exercise. The next school we have is Heartland Elementary. Second runner up is Miss Elise Keister. Elise has unfortunately moved to Colorado. She was a student in Ms. Emmons' class, and her prizes will be mailed to her. The first runner-up is Mr. Peyton Bowers. 
Peyton is a fourth grade student at Heartland Elementary. In Ms. Miller's class, Peyton likes drawing, gaming, and loves to play soccer. The award is presented by Magnolia Bank, presented by Mr. Ken Adams. The winner is Ms. Mackenzie Gilland. Mackenzie is a fifth grade student in Ms. Hall's class at Heartland Elementary. Mackenzie loves reading, art, and she loves to cheer and tumble. <laughs> Mackenzie is a cheerleader at Central Kentucky Athletics. The award is presented by Magnolia Bank. Next up, we have Faith Homeschool. First runner-up is Mr. Brady Pike. Brady is a first grade student in Ms. Pike's class at Faith Homeschool. Brady loves to ride his bike, play outside, and hunting. The award is presented by Magnolia Bank. The winner is Ms. Jenna Pike. Jenna is a fourth grade student in Ms. Pike's class at Faith Homeschool. Jenna loves cooking, choir, and dressing up. The award again is presented by Magnolia Bank. With Creekside Elementary, second runner-up is Miss Ashley Lowe. Ashley attends Creekside Elementary and is a fifth grade student in Miss Bronner's classroom. Ashley likes to play softball, cheerleading, robotics, crafting, Face painting, volunteering, art, pageants, and trying new things. Very busy. The award is presented by Magnolia Bank. First runner up is Miss Addison Phillips. Addison is the first grade student of Miss Sharon at Creekside Elementary. Addison loves art, crafts, playing games, reading, and playing with her friends. Ken Adams with Magnolia Bank. <laughs> the winner is Miss Sadie Atcher. Sadie is a fifth grade student in Miss, Mrs. Wyatt's Cl Creekside Elementary class. Sadie likes to play volleyball, tennis, art, children's group at church, crafts, and spending time with family and friends. The award was presented by Magnolia Bank. And would Lindsay Bridges come up, please? The next school is Meadowview Elementary. Second runner-up is Miss Zion Veneer, Van Leer. Zion is a fifth grade student at Meadowview Elementary in Miss Bott's classroom. Zion loves drawing and painting. The award is presented by Farm Credit Services and Ms. Lindsay Bridges. First runner-up is Ms. Caitlin Hornback. Caitlin is a fifth grade student in Ms. Addison's class at Middleview Elementary. Caitlin loves drawing and reading. The award is sponsored by Farm Credit Services. The winner is Miss Peyton Drum. Peyton is the fifth grade student in Miss Bott's classroom. Peyton loves drawing and playing outside. Again, the award is sponsored by Farm Credit Services. Next, we have Vine Grove Elementary. Third runner up is Miss Alina Perez. Alina is a fifth grade student in Ms. Cecil's at Vine Grove Elementary. Alina enjoys arts, crafts, reading, and drawing. The award is sponsored by Farm Credit Services. The second runner up is Ms. Elena Musan. Elena is a fifth grade student in Ms. Blad's classroom at Vine Grove Elementary. Elena enjoys drawing, reading, Girl Scouts, bowling, loves school and family time. The award is sponsored by Farm Credit Services. <laughs> the 
First runner-up is Miss Jaya Widener. Jaya is a third grade student in Miss Link's classroom at Van Grove Elementary. She loves art, writing, and drawing. The winner is Miss Morgan Hunley. She is a third grade student in Miss Johnston's at Van Grove Elementary. Morgan loves cooking, art, shopping, dancing, and singing. The award is sponsored by Farm Credit Services. Thank you. Alan is up next. If you would, can you give a round of applause to our winners? All right, ladies and gentlemen, you can take your seats. Now here are our art contest county winners. The county grand champion is Miss Sadie Archer. Sadie is in the fifth grade student of Miss Wyatt's at Creekside Elementary. Sadie loves volleyball, tennis, art, children's group at church, crafts, and spending time with family and friends. This award is sponsored by the Hardin County Conservation District and Kentucky Farm Bureau. Are you doing Bob's? Oh, you're doing it. I'll leave this here. Next, we're going to be giving the award for the Jim Claypool Conservation Essay Contest. The school winners from Faith Home School. Second runner up is Miss Lindsay Terrence. Lindsay is an 11th grader at Miss Vaughn's class at Faith Home School. Lindsay loves basketball, horses, and music. This award is sponsored by CPS Cecilia and will be provided by Greg Thomas. Your first runner-up is Mr. Caleb Smith. Caleb is an 11th grader in Ms. Vaughn's class at Faith Home School. Caleb likes Brazilian, Jiu-Jitsu, Math, Science, and Engineering. This award is also sponsored by CPS CIA. Your winner is Ms. Amelia Vaughn. Amelia is an 11th grader in Ms. Vaughn's class at Faith Home School. Amelia loves reading, cooking, and drawing. Again, sponsored by CPS Cecilia. Next will be St. James Catholic School. Our second runner-up is Miss Maddie Stevenson. Maddie is an eighth grade student in Mrs. Hernandez's class at St. James. Maddie loves to play tennis. This award is sponsored by CPS Cecilia. Sure. 
First runner-up is Miss Emmy Redford. Emmy is an eighth grade student in Miss Hernandez's class at St. James. Emmy loves to play tennis. This award is sponsored by CPS. And the winner is Mr. Nate Jarbo. Nate is an eighth grade student in Ms. Hernandez's class. Nate loves to study science, specifically aeronautics and rocket design, shooting archery, running cross country, and participating in quick recall. Thanks CPSSC for sponsoring these. Next will be from North Harden Christian. This is sponsored by Southern States and will be provided by Trish Carden. Our second runner up is Mr. Christopher Moore. Christopher is a ninth grade student in Dr. Hunt's class at North Harden Christian. Christopher loves to play chess, checkers, Lego games, collect Legos, read books, and volunteer at the American Red Cross. I don't think he's here today. Congratulate him anyway. Our first runner-up is Ms. Jesse Johnson. Jesse is a 10th grade student in Mr. Oxford's class at North Harden Christian School. Jesse loves reading, running cross country, baking or cooking, and spending time with friends and watching movies with friends. And our winner is Ms. Catherine Rousseau. Catherine is a 9th grade student in Dr. Hunt's class at North Harden Christian School. Catherine loves swimming, zip lining, basketball, and hiking. She's coming up on the side over here. Next is West Harden Middle School. Our second runner-up is Mr. Matthew Mills. Matthew is a sixth grade student of Miss Lionette's class. Matthew loves reading and writing. First runner-up is Megan Puckett. Megan is a sixth grader in Miss Lionette's class and Megan loves drawing. And our winner is Ms. Justice Anderson. Justice is a seventh grade student in Ms. Meredith's class. Justice enjoys karate and loves playing the clarinet and band. From Central Hardin High School, our winner is Ms. Briley Brawner. Briley is the 11th grade student of Ms. Cannon. She enjoys playing basketball, soccer, hunting, fishing, and cooking. This award is sponsored by Sicilian Bank. It's going to be presented by Mr. Stephen Jones. From Zay's Academy, our winner is Mr. Isaiah Willett. Isaiah is the seventh grade student in Ms. Willett's class at Zay's Academy. Isaiah enjoys skateboarding, reading, and Pokemon.
I'm going to get Alan Morris to come back up here. He's going to present our SA County contest winner. The county grand champion is Miss Amelia Vaughn. <laughs> Amelia is an 11th grade student at Faith Home School and is the proud student of Mrs. Vaughn. Amelia enjoys reading, cooking, and drawing. Let's congratulate all of our students. The Hardin County Conservation District has been supporting the youth of the community for many years. I asked earlier how long they had been doing their um, agriculture and natural resource scholarships and Mr. Glenn says it's been 20 years or longer, so I uh, commend that, and again, we'd love to su support the youth in our community. So as I call your name, please come forward if you're here. Miss Caitlin Tucker is from Central Hardin High School. She will be attending Western Kentucky University and majoring in ag education. Brenton Ryan is from Central Hardin High School. He's going to be attending Western Kentucky University and majoring in agribusiness. <laughs> Garrett Hatfield is from Central Hardin High School. is going to be attending Iowa State University and majoring in agribusiness. Blake Ryan from Central Hardin High will be attending Western Kentucky University and majoring in agribusiness. Benjamin Thomas is from Central Hardin High School will be attending ECC and Technical College majoring in agribusiness or general agriculture. Austin Reynolds is from Central Hardin High School and will be attending the University of Kentucky and majoring in animal science and pre-vet. <laughs> Leslie Langley attending Western Kentucky University and plans to become a 4-H extension agent. Aaron Masterson is attending Western Kentucky University and pl plans to become an ag educator. <laughs> Madeline Meek is attending U of L and transferring to Western Kentucky University in the fall and plans to become an agriculture teacher. Kelly Lowen attending University of Kentucky and plans on becoming a veterinarian. <laughs> Brianne Williams attends Western Kentucky University and plans to become a soil conservationist. <laughs> a 
and Kevin Graves attends Elizabethtown Community and Technical College and plans to become a wildlife biologist. Thank you and congratulations to all of our scholarship recipients. Next, we're going to have Alan Morse, who's going to present our Friend of Conservation Award. The American Heritage Dictionary defines friend as a person who knows, likes, and trusts, and one who supports or sympathizes with a group, cause, or movement. Tonight's recipient of the Friend of Conservation Award definitely fits that description, Mr. Byron Nelson. This year's award has been given to Byron Nelson due to his volunteering services with the Hardin County Conservation District. Byron has worked for the Division of Forestry for 15 years, with four and a half of those years being a regional forester. During those 15 years, he has helped hand out <clears throat> tree seedlings for the Hardin County Conservation District, and participated in Meade, Breckenridge, and Laurel County's tree seedings giveaway as well. Byron was a ranger for 10 years in Hardin, Meade, and Breckenridge counties. In fact, he received Ranger Inspector of the Year two years in a row. He's also done more logging inspections than anyone else. He has also completed an equip practice with fencing through the Hardin County Conservation District. Byron grew up on a dairy farm, but since retiring in January of this year, has enjoyed spending time on his beef cattle farm. It gives us great pleasure to present Byron Nelson, this year's Friend of the Conservation Award. Thank you, Alan. The next award I'm getting ready to give out is the Master of Conservationist Award. This year's prestigious Master Conservationist Award is presented to Wayne No. Wayne No has operated and owned his farm for 20 years in Hardin County. He runs a cow and calf operation on around 75 acres here in Hardin County. Wayne has recently retired from construction and since then has focused more on his cattle operation. Over the past few years, Wayne has been improving his farm by increasing his paddock numbers and beginning a rotation management system with his cattle. In doing so, Wayne has increased his herd size to 40 cows. Wayne has currently completed a state cost share contract that assisted him with adding four watering facilities and renovating 20 acres of his pasture by adding more legumes to already lush stand of grass. There are currently seven paddocks in use with an eighth one being in development. The majority of work has been completed on his own through information learned from other cattle operators and the University of Kentucky Extension Office programs offered in the state. Wayne has attended the Master Conservation, the Master, excuse me, the Master Grazing School Master Cattleman's Course, and the UK Stocking Program. We are continuing to work with Wayne on his operation and to help him to help the land for future generations to come. It gives us great pleasure to present Mr. Wayne No with this year's Master Conservationist Award. getting ready to present the Educator of the Year Award. Uh, if you can understand me, I'm losing my voice, but uh, this year's Educator of the Year Award goes to Mrs. Miranda Pike. When I started working at the district in September of 2016, Miranda was the first teacher that I got to meet. She has been such a great asset to me and the district. Miranda and her husband, Joe, are the parents of seven children. When I spoke with Joe, 
He said, Miranda's mom is an amazing teacher, and she, who, she is who definitely inspired Miranda to be a teacher. Miranda loves studying the Bible and loves being with her family. She is a very talented writer, photographer, and piano player. Miranda has been a pleasure to work with, and we look forward to continuing to work with her in the future. It gives us great pleasure to present Miranda Pike with this year's Educator of the Year. It's my pleasure to award the Embry Lay Wildlife Award to Mr. Brian Mackey. I actually got to tour his operation a couple weeks ago. I was very impressed with the work that he has done, both through our programs and also on his own, of his own accord. I'd like to re recognize Brian. He's with Dixie Stock Farms. His dad started it in 1952 and rolled the ground in CRP starting in the 80s. They now crop 300 acres, have 700 head of beef cattle, and have 120 acres of hay and pasture land. They exclusively no-till all of their crop ground. They have two farms, which combine for 44 acres of filter strips. In 2015, they installed four and a quarter acres of native grass and forbs as a field border for quail habitat. In 2016, he planted 10 acres of native warm season grasses for quail and small game habitat. Also in 2016, he enrolled in CRP for a two to three acre shallow water area for waterfowl. He is an avid hunter and outdoorsman that takes pride in farming and caring for the land and the wildlife. It gives me great pleasure, it gives the district great pleasure to present Brian Mackey with Dixie Stock Farms with this year's Embry Lay Wildlife Stewardship Award. If anybody knows me, they know I do not like to be up here, but I'll do it. Um, we do have, a, I have a couple announcements. We have teacher's bags at the back. For all the teachers that I call for your t-shirt sizes, they're at the back table and they're marked. Uh, I do have some thank yous. Cheryl Peterson that works in our office has been a great help. Uh, love. Um, Cheryl Love. Uh, she's been a great help the last two weeks more than that. She's printed out a lot of stuff, helped me so much. Uh, I have two sisters here tonight, uh, Barbara McCamish and Wilma Ritchie, if they can stand up. They have helped me a lot. Uh, Barbara done the flower arrangements on the tables and Wilma's helped with numerous things. Kimberly Bartley was here this afternoon and helped me. Butch and Nan, um, I couldn't do it by myself and I, I thank everybody that helped me. Um, the door prizes on the table are whoever's birthday is the closest to mine, which is June 21st, gets the door prize. So whoever at the table is birthday's closest to June 21st gets to take the, the cans. Make sure you take the, uh, the uh, rain gauges and ink pens and all that with you. Thanks, everyone. I'm sorry for it taking so long tonight. As everybody can see, we had a very large crowd. But thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for eating the food. And hopefully we'll see you all next year.